I want to call to order the December 18th, 2012 regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners. I'm going to invite to the uh, uh, microphone tonight uh, one of our police officers who is re retiring at the end of this month and uh, assuming a higher calling with New Friendship Baptist Church over in Logan County and Detective Barry Rayleigh after 20 years. We really do hate to see you go. It would be tough shoes to fill, but we understand where you're going and what you're doing, and we're, we appreciate that too. So if you'd like to, we'd uh, have you offer the invocation. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. It's only right that we begin our time together tonight. Lord, just uh, thanking you for your rich blessings upon us, acknowledging, Father, that uh, we are a blessed people, and we just uh, need your help in our world tonight, Father. We also uh, understand that all around us, Father, there's people that are struggling, that are hurting in our country and even our own communities. And so tonight, Father, you've ordained the matter of government and the business of government to, Father, work in society to make it a better place. And we have police officers and servants, Father, all over. And so we pray for our leaders here in this meeting tonight, for those that will be uh, sworn in tonight as new police officers, others being promoted, and for all the business of the city, Father, we just trust that we would do it in a way that uh, honors you and that, Father, is uh, according to principles that are right and good. And, Lord, I pray for our country again tonight that you would just watch over and protect us right here in this Christmas season. Father, help us to truly remember the reason for the season. It's a season of giving you gave us your perfect gift, your son, to be our savior, and we thank you for that tonight. So, Lord, bless the mayor and the commissioners and the city manager and, again, all who uh, conduct business here. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us and for blessing our lives, and it's in the name of Jesus we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Can you join me as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Michelle, please call the roll. Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Waltrip. Here. Commissioner Denning. Here. Mayor Wilkerson. Here. Uh, we have one item of unfinished business to take care of. Uh, last um, Friday we had the uh, Christmas open house where we had the swearing in of the new commission and Mr. Denning was unable to be with us at that time, suffering from the flu. If you hear his voice, he's still suffering from it, but uh, uh, we're going to take care of that piece of business right tonight. If you would, Joe, we've invited Warren District Judge Sam Potter to administer the oath of office, which we're required to do before January 1st. So. Joe, Judge, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Denny, right. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to be here to swear uh, Commissioner Denny back into office. And if you would raise your right hand, do you, Commissioner Denny, solemnly swear or affirm? that you will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the Commonwealth and be faithful and true to the Commonwealth of Kentucky so long as you continue to be a citizen thereof and will you faithfully execute to the best of your ability the office of City Commissioner of the City of Bowling Green according to law and do you further solemnly swear or affirm that since the adoption of the present Constitution that you um, <clears throat> being a citizen of the state of this state have not fought, fought a duel with deadly weapons within the state or out of it nor have you accepted a challenge to fight a duel with deadly weapons nor have you acted as a second to carrying out a challenge nor aided or assisted any person thus offending so help you god i do Thank my pleasure you. congratulations Thank you, Judge. We appreciate your time coming to help us this evening. Uh, one other thing we get to do in our awards and recognitions uh, or portion of the meeting is to take a minute to recognize some, someone, a group of people who have 
made such an outstanding uh, accomplishment for our community, brought uh, so much acclaim to Bowling Green and Bowling Green High School. And I'd like to invite uh, Coach Kevin Wallace and the 2012 Bowling Green High Purple senior class from the football team to come while we acknowledge them in a, with a proclamation. Come right on up, gentlemen. We'll just make a big U right here so that all of you can be seen by everybody on camera and at home too. Champions. Coach, if you would join me up here and members of the commission. Now, I don't know that this has happened in many occasions, but we get to do this two years in a row. And this is a proclamation from both the city of Bowling Green and Warren County, if you'll allow me the courtesy of reading it. The season, we're going to proclaim this the season of Bowling Green Purples football again for 2012. Whereas the Bowling Green High football team maintained a perfect 15-0 winning season for 2012, and whereas the Bowling Green High School football team won their second consecutive Kentucky 5A football championship game in the Commonwealth Gridiron, Gridiron Bowl, and whereas the Bowling Green High football team won the championship by a score of 34 to 20, and whereas the Bowling Green High School football team and the coaching staff led by co head coach Kevin Wallace has dominated high school football in 2012 again, and whereas Bowling Green High School Purple's fans are the greatest fans in Kentucky, now we therefore being the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners and Warren County Fiscal Court do hereby proclaim 2012 as a season of Bowling Green Purple's football in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and acknowledge this outstanding accomplishment in the area of high school athletics and encourage everyone to congratulate all the members of the team and their coaching staff, and it's a good day to be a Purple. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. The young men that you see uh, standing in front of you are our seniors from the 2012 football team. Uh, they have led and demonstrated uh, the greatest work ethic that I've been associated with in a long, long time. And it was a pleasure to be a part of their final season. We also have Coach Steve Dotson, Coach DeMont Franklin here with us tonight. We certainly appreciate this honor and we appreciate the support of, of this city and we're so proud to represent you and I, and I hope that not only that we represent you well on the football field but hopefully these young men are going to be some of the leaders in this community in future years. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thank you gentlemen. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Do you want to introduce them? Oh, okay, I'm going to introduce these guys individually. I'm sorry. We had so many last year. We brought our seniors. We had 31. So we weren't going to introduce all those guys individually. It would take it all night. I'll start to my left. Uh, Daniel Sansom, a defensive lineman. A defensive lineman, Elvis Muscovit. Defensive lineman, Anthony Nichols. Uh, offensive lineman, Stone Begley. Uh, defensive back, Alan Gonzalez, who got to play in the uh, Kentucky All-Star game last week. And, uh, uh, we'll be playing in the Kentucky-Tennessee game in, in, in uh, January. Uh, outside linebacker Jalen Brown, linebacker Aaron Huffman, defensive lineman Daniel Ronto, tight end Trey Coleman, offensive lineman Mitchell Adamick, wide receiver Spencer Renfro. If you saw the state championship game, you saw Spencer catch a touchdown pass. Defensive lineman Doug Stratton and our manager William Duncan. Thanks, guys. brought tonight we'll do something a little bit later mr defebo do you have yeah something? uh mayor i have a couple items first there'll be a need for an executive session and kate will read the reason well, can we do that in just a minute i'm, I'm sorry i meant awards and recognition oh okay there... i'm sorry yeah um yeah tonight uh, i'd like to acknowledge uh, the budget team and uh, the finance department under jeff meisel we received notification that the city was awarded from the gfoa which stands for government finance officials association 
what is known as a budget uh, presentation, distinguished budget presentation award for this year. So the budget that we're operating under this year is an award-winning budget. So I'd just like to acknowledge again all the employees in the finance department and the budget team. Good job, Jeff. Thanks. I believe we have our first Operation Pride presentation uh, by Quentin Hughes, retired Bowling police officer. We're just everywhere, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, greetings and uh, hello from the Operation Pride Board of, Board of Directors. Thank you for your allowing us time to represent and to uh, present this award to the city of Bowling Green. That tonight is our co-winners of acclimates of two buildings that were uh, taken care of. I have a slight presentation here for uh, the Operation Pride December 12 awards for the city of Bowling Green. First of all, the Public Works building, which is the building right next door here that was uh, renovated. This is the before picture at 10 to 11 College Street. Uh, and our after picture with the much improved aesthetic appeal and curb appeal that the building presented. Uh, and the rear of that building also is those of you that walk through that park lot know that this is much of an upgrade and certainly uh, a great improvement of what we had before. So our December 2012 Pride Commercial World first award for the Public Works, and I believe Jim Lashley is here to receive that. Mayor, Commissioners, and Senior Staff. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. We appreciate you being here. Very quickly, we'd like to thank Operation Pride for this award. I've uh, been involved in quite a few buildings over the years. Uh, I tell people that we work with, I don't pick out colors. <laughs> and I didn't pick out the colors on this one, and it turned out very well in, in those cases. Uh, but again, thank you to Operation Pride. Okay, you, can't, you can't say that without telling us who did, though. Um, uh, um, Jackie and um, Tammy, I don't remember her last name. Okay. Uh, pick those out so thank you it was not me all right thank I'll you thank you all right any other awards and recognitions all right now mr city manager go ahead. uh one comment mayor there'll be a need for an executive session uh katie will read the the reason pursuant to Kara 61810b for deliberations on the future acquisition or sale of real property by the city but only when publicity would likely affect the value of the specific piece of property to be acquired for public use or sold by the city so moved Second. Motion by Hill, second by Waltrip. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. We have next the uh, approval of minutes for the regular meeting from December 4th, 2012. So moved. Second. Motion by Hill, second by Denning. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Next section of our meeting has to do with public comments. If there's someone in the audience that has a comment to make about an item that is not on our agenda, we would invite them to the microphone now. If you would remind us of your name and address, please. Ray Bickerstaff uh, from Alberton. We wanted to, uh, Colonel Robert Spiller uh, from uh, Oakland, and I wanted to bring you up to date on our status for the uh, nursing home for veterans in this area. We've been working throughout this past year with um, Rodney Kirtley, Executive Director of Brad and his grant writer to develop a proposal for uh, requesting funding for uh, nursing home for veterans. We have uh, received letters of support uh, 
from the mayor, thank you, and uh, from Mitch McConnell and all of our uh, uh, several legislators in the state and all the appropriate uh, county officials um, from the two hospitals here in town, the medical society, all of the uh, uh, veterans organizations, and we're continuing to get support from the entire Brad area. Now, we have all of that up to this uh, point, but one thing we really need is your all's help in uh, identifying individuals in the community that have uh, land that could uh, be appropriated for the site for the uh, nursing home for veterans. Um, we need to uh, move on this as soon as possible because uh, if we prepared this proposal we already have together with the demographic data and uh, other uh, information, then this would be a very worthwhile project to uh, uh, send to the state legislature uh, and uh, get some action as soon as we possibly can. And the reason for this is that we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, applications uh, nationwide and we want to get on the list we have to get on that list and uh, heaven help us if we end up getting second or third on the list even in the state of Kentucky we know that Owensboro uh, Fort Thomas Somerset are very much interested I had a call this last week from a good friend of mine in Ashland that wants a copy of everything we're doing here so they can submit a proposal. But Ashland, Ironton, and Huntington, that's a big uh, proposal. So we don't want to end up in Frankfurt with all these other uh, uh, cities with the same type of proposal. And timing is very important. We have all the efforts up to this point. We need your help in talking with uh, individuals that have land that could be appropriated, um, maybe with our county officials that may be in possibly a better uh, position for uh, the facility. But we do need to get this together in a package that goes to uh, Frankfurt uh, in January or February. It's got to be done now. Otherwise, if we get behind these other cities, we're talking about uh, 20 to 30 years down the road before we could, we may be completely off the map, so we can't uh, do that. It's very important that we're number one in Kentucky, and I think we are at this moment with the best proposal together, and uh, we certainly want to get on the list nationally. And uh, we've got very good support, but now it's time, and we really need your help to uh, help identify some uh, locations that would work and we need to notify uh, Rodney Kirtley, Executive Director Brad, so we can incorporate this in the proposal that would go directly to Frankfurt. Uh, Spiller. I don't get a chance to talk very much, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> I am Colonel Robert E. Spiller. I was in the Army 30 years. I was in the uh, Korean War and the Vietnam War. I've been retired 32 years. And would you believe a week from the day, I'll be 84 years old, Christmas Day. So, <laughs> you know, I'm an old one. And the reason I bring this up because I'm not a young kid trying to get into a nursing home. <laughs> but Bowling Green and Warren County are desperately in need of a nursing home for veterans, as he just announced. Kentucky now has three such homes, and another will be approved in January and opened in 2015. But all four of these are at least an hour and a half drive from here. So I have dealt with people who want to go up to our close nursing home. I'll use Madison, Madisonville as a city and a 84-year-old lady can't go see her husband an hour and a half away and drive at nighttime. That won't cut it. In this area, we have <coughs> over 21,000 veterans, all of whom 
would be eligible for a bed in one of these sites. But all four have, or will soon, have waiting lists that measure at least 20 veterans each, and sometimes it's much higher than that, a, fig a figure that will grow considerably in the next 20 years. If we commence presenting our case now, we will have a chance to go near the top of the list for the next state home. These veterans' homes take two years to build and require they would like to have 30 acres of land for each home. When completed, they will be home to 120 veterans. They can possibly employ up to 300 people, and the payroll for the operation will run over $10 million a year. This payroll runs for physicians, <coughs> for housekeepers, and includes nursing staff, maintainers, security, food service, and a variety of jobs. Think of what that will mean for our community. Since the 1st of July, 86 veterans have died out of these nursing homes. So, uh, I know Bowling Green's gonna support this. You've supported it before. But uh, uh, just tell all of your friends around, whether they're politicians or not, that we desperately need the fifth nursing home in Bowling Green. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel. And if somebody has some land that they'd like to donate to this, they call Rodney Kirtley at the Bear River Development yeah. District. Yes. All right, sir. Right. Of course, I get so many phone calls, so it won't bother me if you call me. Thank I you. Thank you. Especially if they got 30 acres, right, Colonel? Do what? Especially if they've got 30 acres, you'd be glad to take the call, won't you? Oh, amen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, all you know history. We actually had the land before. Up there by uh, exit uh, 28 on I-65. We had the land. But the politicians got into this, and the nursing home went over to Madisonville and just gave up the land. But we have had the land before. And uh, Lord willing, we're going to get the land again. Thank you. Thank you. And you understand this, this entire commission supports you. We passed a resolution uh, supporting that effort uh, earlier this year. I believe it was this year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other public comments before we get to the regular meat of the agenda? All right. Municipal Order 2012-222. Municipal Order approving the reappointments of Kevin D. DeFebo, Gary Dillard, Harold McGuffey, and Johnny Webb, and the appointment of Melinda M. Hill to serve on the Intermodal Transportation Authority Incorporated Board of Directors, and authorizing the submission of reappointments and an appointment to the Warren County Judge Executive. So moved. Motion by Nash, Good. second by Waltrip. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2012-223. Municipal Order approving the promotions of Penny L. Bowles to the position of Assistant Police Chief, Brian E. Harold to the position of Police Captain, and Bernard J. Wiedemer to the position of Police Sergeant in the Police Department. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash and second by Waltrip, Mr. Febo. Uh, Mayor, I'd ask the police chief to come forward and put his names uh, of his candidates into nomination. Mr. Hawkins. Chief Hawkins. Thank you, Mayor and Commission. I appreciate you letting me be here tonight uh, to bring these uh, fine officers before you for promotion. Um, I recall a conversation I had with Chief Waltrip about six years ago. <clears throat> and he said, reminded me as he was finishing his career as chief and I was beginning to mind that one of the most difficult things for a chief to do is to make decisions about promotions because everybody on the list deserves um, the opportunity and they have competed for that and have earned that right. The difficult thing uh, for the chief to do is decide which of those eligible candidates gets the opportunity. And uh, I would uh, say six years on that uh, he said nothing more true than that uh, it was a difficult task and perhaps one of the most important and difficult tasks that a chief engages in. 
Um, that being said, tonight we have three uh, worthy candidates for promotion, and I want to discuss those individually if I can. Um, Captain Penny Bowles, um, who is here and supported by her husband, uh, Brad, son Harrison, and uh, daughter Laura, uh, father uh, Roger and, and mother Wendy, uh, are here to support her tonight, along with, uh, as you can see, a number of police officers. Um, one of the interesting things, Penny, uh, before she became a police officer, worked at McDonald's on the bypass when it was in the 1500 block of the bypass. And in those days, we did, um, uh, we, we followed uh, employees of stores very late at night to the bank so that they could make their night deposit. And uh, of course, times being what they are and, and manpower being what it is, we can no longer uh, do that consistently. But um, we, uh, we knew Penny before she became a police officer because she worked at the night shift many times as, a, as an assistant manager at McDonald's. And so uh, I don't know if uh, she encourages us to eat more or if we encourage her to become a police officer. I think both have been true consequently. Um, Penny was hired uh, January 8th of 1996, promoted to sergeant January 22nd of 2003, and uh, promoted to captain uh, November the 4th. 2009. It's interesting to note that she also served as an, uh, an acting captain for a period of time before she was promoted, um, I believe, while Brett Hightower was deployed. Um, Penny serves on the Honor Guard and has done so for uh, 14 years, and uh, she led the training unit during uh, part of her time as uh, both as sergeant and as captain. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree from Western Kentucky University and a master's degree from Eastern Kentucky University. She has attended the Academy of Police Supervision, the Criminal Justice Executive Development course, and the Strategic School of Leadership, none of which are easy to accomplish, and she's done well at all of them. Um, I certainly uh, feel confident that she can uh, do the job that we're asking her to do by uh, being promoted to Assistant Chief. Also before you tonight, uh, Sergeant Brian Harrell. Um, Brian is from Litchfield and uh, I think bro has brought the largest contingent tonight. I think the last three rows <laughs> on this side are all Brian Harrell's family. Uh, I obviously can't mention those uh, all, well, I will try. Um, Michelle, his, his wife, and I'll tell you a story about Michelle in a minute. Son Keegan and son Hayden. Uh, his mother, uh, Alethea is here, or Althea, I'm sorry, Althea is here. Uh, stepfather Ron McKinney, I, I believe, Mr. McKinney, are you here tonight? Uh, who's the retired uh, police chief for Hardensburg, Kentucky. Um, his brother Keith, his sister Kimberly, and his stepmother uh, Donna Robinson are here. Uh, we welcome them and their support of Brian. Um, Brian told me one time, he said uh, he met his wife in Litchfield, and um, it's, it's no surprise if you look at, at Michelle, she's an attractive woman, and Brian said, um, before he left Litchfield and brought her to Bowling Green, he had to marry her so she wouldn't meet an attractive man in, in Bowling Green. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I think he was successful at doing that, and they've been happy and obviously um, have a family together. Um, Brian was hired in January of 8th of 1996, promoted to Sergeant July 3rd of 2007. Um, he has served as a detective. Uh, he is uh, 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 one heck of a hostage negotiator. Uh, for the police department and currently serves in criminal investigations as a supervisor. Uh, of note, uh, he has won the Life Saving Medal twice, um, which is a rare accomplishment to earn it once and to earn it twice is extraordinary. Um, he currently serves in, in the U.S. Army Reserves and with, at the rank of Chief Warrant Officer 2. Uh, he uh, has the specialties of combat medic, medevac medic, drill sergeant, and currently serves in, in the reserves as special agent in the criminal investigations division in the military. Brian is attending, uh, has attended WKU and is working toward his degree. I am also confident in uh, Sergeant Harrell's uh, ability to perform the tasks that we're asking him to perform at captain. And Bernie Wiedemer, uh, who is here with his daughter, Kirsten and his son Timothy. Uh, I heard them in the back a few minutes ago. They're proud of their dad. Um, Bernie grew up in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, has served in the, uh, the, the U.S. Army. He served uh, active duty from 1984 to 1994, um, has uh, served in other police agencies prior to coming to us, 
in the Anne Arundel County Police Department, and I wish for the life of me I knew which state that was in, but I forgot to ask him. Maryland. Isn't in Maryland, Maryland, thank you. And, uh, and then as a deputy sheriff in the Pinellas County uh, Sheriff's Department in Pinellas County, Florida, which is the St. Petersburg area. Um, Bernie was hired uh, June 11th, 2007. He uh, is uh, a fine police training officer. We rely on him to do that, and he's one of the select few motor officers that are specially trained to ride motorcycle. Uh, his rank in the military was Sergeant First Class. Um, for those of you and Commissioner Denning, I know you know it's always important to know which high school some folks come from. He retired, I'm sorry, he didn't retire. He graduated, actually, um, from St. X in Louisville. Does that have any bearing on anything? Uh St. X has always been a powerhouse in everything. And this certainly uh, shows in him. He, he's an outstanding gentleman and an excellent police officer. And, and tonight they're a powerhouse in police work. Hey, can't beat that. Still not a purple. Still not <laughs> a purple. No, 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 no. got to work. Work a little longer to be a purple. I, 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 it, I would be remiss to, to, to not say that everybody that was on these promotional lists is an outstanding uh, group of men and women that I had to choose from, and it was an honor for me to be able to select the uh, candidates that we brought before you tonight. Um, and we would ask that you approve um, by your consent and hopefully unanimously um, the promotions of these three, three fine officers. Thank you very much. Well, Chief, um, before you leave, uh, well, you got to be up there again anyway. Uh, as you know, I don't get involved in the personalities and the experience of individuals like this. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, the number one on the list there that is going to be the your assistant police chief. Yes. Um, well, I just won't get into it. I won't go for it. <laughs> Might, might I say, there is some, as long as you brought it up and if you'll allow me to elaborate, <coughs> there is some redeeming qualities uh, and that, that I know you will appreciate. Um, her husband, Brad, who's here tonight, is, worked at one time um, for maybe the finest police department in the state. However, he did retire from the Kentucky State Police. I know. I know. I, I talked to him a few days before that. But once a member of the thin gray line, always a member. I understand that. And, and But you can't blame him because his dad was also a retiree from the Kentucky yeah, State Police. Yeah, I, I know him too. So a good family nonetheless. I agree with you. Is there anything left to be said? I don't know. <laughs> I was just checking, being a good public servant that I am, I just want to make sure that we're getting the best. Please call her uh, Matter of fact, did you mention, Chief, that her mother's here right back there? I, she, I did mention, but would you like me to have her stand? Yeah, have her stand, because yes. she's been here for all these promotions. Thank you. Now, Thank you. I would also uh, ask for the candidates that are uh, being recognized for promotion, uh, if you all will stand. They already stand. Oh, well, Brian is not. Stand. I'm sorry. Bernie's exactly. in the back, and of course, Penny. Congratulations, gentlemen. But, but the one formality I forgot to do is we need to vote on you, so call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? With pleasure. Wilkerson? And yes. Thank you again. Appreciate y'all coming. You're going to stick around for the next one before you head out? All right. Municipal Order 2012-224. Municipal order approving the probationary appointments of Dustin R. Bowman, Jonathan P. Brown, J. Andrew Mann, D. Tyler Norris, and Stephen D. Purvis to the position of police officer in the police department. So moved. Second. Motion by Denning, second by Nash. Mr. DeFebo. Uh, as the commission knows, uh, promotions uh, set in motion, a refilling of, of back positions. Uh, we're here tonight to ask your permission to fill uh, five of those positions. The candidates who have uh, secured these positions have participated in a, a rarefied selection process. There was 152 applicants, uh, 114 actually showed up for the test, which is interesting commentary. Uh, 57 passed the test, 39 showed for the physical, uh, 36 passed, 20 were selected for a polygraph, and, and 10 were interviewed. 
from that distillation, we believe we have the, the five right candidates, and I, I believe uh, they are here tonight. They are. Would you mind standing so we can let everybody see who you are? Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Congratulations. But before we vote, Joe, three of them are central grads now. Yeah, I've already talked to them. Okay. Uh, I made the point to see them before we started our meeting. They know what I expect of them. Oh, great. And then I asked them if they were Bully Green High football players. Right. I am so sorry. <laughs> Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Congratulations again. I know you guys are going to excuse yourself and go downstairs and get some pens and pictures and stuff. So thank you again for coming in. All right. Uh, municipal Order 2012-225. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2013-14 for the Hobson Grove Haynes Field renovation from Parlane Outdoor Solutions of Bowling Green, Kentucky in the amount of $31,793. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash and second by <coughs> in, in an effort to keep uh, high quality uh, sports fields, uh, this year in our capital budget, we uh, had anticipated uh, regrading the field and installing irrigation and topsoil and seeding at the uh, Hobson Grown Haynes field. We had three bidders and uh, Parlane Outdoor Solutions, the Bowling Green was the lowest. Uh, J.B. Belcher is here if you have any questions. And any questions for J.B.? <laughs> Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2012-226. Municipal Order authorizing the acceptance of 2013 grant funds from the Appalachia High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area through the Office of National Drug Control Policy in the amount of $30,000. So moved. Second. Motion by uh, Nash, second by Denning. Mr. Febo. Uh Mayor, this is a, an acceptance of $30,000 in, in funding uh, from the National Drug Policy uh, Appalachian High Intensive Drug Trafficking Area Grant. Uh, Jennifer Nash applied for this. This money will be used uh, to support uh, the, the participation of two officers in the Drug Task Force. It will support 800 hours of overtime uh, for two officers. Uh, Jennifer Nash is here if you have any questions. Any discussion or questions? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance 2012-42. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances, Ordinance amending Chapter 23, Water and Sewer of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances to make various administrative changes. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash and second by Waltrip. Uh, these next five uh, first reading of ordinances are uh, a continuation of an initiative that uh, Mr. Denning began a couple of years ago uh, as far as requiring that some of our boards um, accept a, a commissioner by ordinance rather than by request. Uh, so this is a good time to do it as these terms uh, now end and as we begin a new section, and Mr. Harmon, do you have any comments about, especially on the BGMU? One? Well, especially on the first one, because the mayor really didn't point that one out to us. Katie and I have been talking for quite some time that we need to go back and relook at this ordinance. Uh, approximately, I don't care, what, 14 years ago or so, we amended the Code of Ordinances to require that BGMU board appointees be appointed by ordinance, require two readings instead of one. Uh, we thought there's really no longer a need to do that. We appoint all board members by municipal order, so we thought we'd go in and make that change. Um, while I was looking at that one, I also went back and looked at the statutes. Uh, hopefully I picked up everything. I may, you know, can't guarantee I picked up everything, but did notice a couple of things in the state statute that we did not have in our ordinance. One of them, for example, a statute said that uh, members have to be residents of the city a year before their appointments. Our ordinance said two, so I revised that two down to one. Uh, also, the state statute says that, of course, there's a five-member board, four citizens, with the fifth one being our ordinance said a board a member of the Board of Commissioners. The state statute says it can be a member of the Board of Commissioners or the, the uh, city manager at the discretion of the mayor. So I just amended our language again to comply with the state statute. Uh, made a couple of other administrative things. One, uh, the uh, BGMU board members, other than 
you persons who are, who are on it. Uh, I think do get a, a small monthly stipend for being on the board. Now, our ordinance basically said, uh, well, you're paid uh, basically whatever the statute says. The statute says, well, you're paid whatever the city decides. So it really didn't, you know, like go to A, back to B, and B, back to A. Uh, so I went in and, and made a re uh, revision to that language that left it up to the BGMU board to determine what that compensation would be, not to exceed the maximum by statute, but leave it up to the board because, uh, again, with that money coming from their budget, not from the, uh, not from the city. And there were a couple of, uh, two or three administrative changes I thought I'd make at the same time. The statute says it's up to the BGMU board to determine their board procedures and their bylaws and their meeting requirements. But we had a couple of things in statute or in ordinance, I'm not really sure why or when we did it, but you know, basically said that we controlled, you know, put language in about how they added uh, items to their agenda, you know, how they vote on minutes, and I thought you know, it's probably more than we need to be uh, in our ordinance. And on top of that, I don't think we were ever doing it. Uh, so if it was redundant, I figured, at least, you know, we weren't doing it, I didn't see need to do it, so I made that change as well. Um, I did run these by Bud Strickler, the attorney for PGMU, and I think he ran them by Mark as well. They were okay with them. There's one last small change, but that was because uh, BGMU came in a few months ago and did some of their, their recommended changes, and we had a typo on one that we went back in and changed that typo. But uh, these were basically staff recommendations. This one didn't come from the mayor, but we thought this was a good time to be taking care of the BGMU issue at the same time we were doing these. And I'll be glad to answer questions. Any questions or discussion? Yes, sir. Is the requirement that a board member can serve no longer than eight years a state requirement? I think it is. I can finally make sure, but I think it is. Yeah. If it's not, I would encourage the board going forward uh, to take a look at that. Uh, there are a lot of, I've served on the BGMU board for the last six years. There are a lot of issues uh, where the, the BGMU board is working with the Warren County Water District. The Warren County Water District doesn't have such a policy, and it really puts the BGMU board members at a disadvantage when it comes time to negotiate and talk about things just from a, in an institutional knowledge standpoint. I realize eight years sounds like a really long time, uh, but the technical knowledge required to serve on the BGMU board is pretty great. Well, and I should know the answer. I don't, but I'll confirm yeah. and make sure, and I'll let you know. Anything you else? don't have to let me know. You can let them know. <laughs> I'll let you know as well. Thanks. <laughs> Any other comments? Questions? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance 2012-43. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances, Ordinance amending Chapter 6, Building Regulations of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances to amend the composition of a contractor's licensing board. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash and second by Hill. Is there any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance 2012-44. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances, Ordinance amending Chapter 14, Housing of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances to amend the composition of the Housing Authority Board of Directors. So Motion by Nash, second by Denning. Any discussion? That, that again is to comport with state law on that Yeah, the state statute says mayor or his designee. Our ordinance didn't have the words designate. Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> Ellen Renault kicked me off there. <laughs> okay. That's, 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 that's a long time ago. <laughs> Any other discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of uh, Ordinance 2012-45. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances, Ordinance amending Chapter 11, Finance, Taxation, and Economic Development of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances to amend the composition of the Job Development Incentive Program Committee. So moved. Second. Motion by Denning and second by Hill. And this one is this not one. really to change the composition other than to allow it to be two commissioners rather than a mayor and a commissioner. Yeah, the any, current any language two says members a mayor and board. one commissioner will basically eliminate a mayor requirement. It says any two members, which can include a mayor, mm -hmm. but just now any two members of the board. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denny? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2012-227. 
Municipal order approving and authorizing the mayor to execute grant of easement with Auburndale Gary Limited Partnership 2 related to placement of sign near the intersection of Campbell Lane and West Park Drive. So moved. Second. Motion by Walter, second by Nash. Mr. DeFebo, you want me to do this one? Uh, I can um, essentially uh, around this intersection, uh, there's a lot of development going on uh, in the Gary Farms. Uh, uh, tract. Um, there is a, a zoning ordinance that limits the number of signs one can have into a, a subdivision or a, or a plat. Uh, the creative solution to this was two partners, two businesses got together and they agreed by agreement to allow one business to allow another to use their, their place for signage to assist the other business owners. I think that's the century. Yeah, this, this happens to be some leftover right away when West Park Drive was built to cut through, and there's already a consolidated shopping center sign on the Gary Farms Boulevard set intersection with Scottsville Road and the Gary Farms Boulevard intersection with Campbell Lane. This is the third leg of that at West Park Drive and Campbell Lane, and just, just completes that triangle and using a sm little small section of yeah, and Historically, before your time, I think Commissioner Denny may have been on, but if, you, if, if people remember several years ago, the city actually bought color time. It right. said where this road used to be so that development, uh, West Park could be extended all the way to Campbell Lane. So we did, we worked cooperatively with the developer. We bought that property, uh, basically gave it, uh, turned it over to right away. They built that road all the way into Campbell Lane. Um, now they have two signs on, uh, on their property at the other end, or maybe one of them may be in the right away, but now they, to continue the commercial development, I think they need a commercial sign at this intersection, and they don't have any land to put it. Uh, so they came to us asking if we could put it in the excess right away. Uh, we've, uh, Public Works has looked at the location, they're okay with it. Uh, if you see, we worked out an easement, and I think everybody's okay with the language of the easement, and uh, you know, we've been told that this was a very important consideration for them to continue in that development. I think this is maybe the, the area where Myers has uh, since now been public in the paper, <laughs> that maybe the Myers and maybe other future potential commercial uh, development may take place in that area. Any other discussion? Questions? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal order, well, first thing we have to do is remove Municipal Order 2012-221 from the table for consideration. So moved. Mo motion by Waltrip and second by Nash. There's no discussion on this. We go straight to a vote, so please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. And now Municipal Order 2012-221. Municipal order approving and authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement related to the connection of the city's CAD system and an agreement for the continuation of Warren County Volunteer Fire Department dispatch <coughs> service by the city of Bowling Green, both agreements being between the city of Bowling Green and Warren County. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash and second by Hill. Uh, Mr. Febo, would you remind us what sure. the, the details uh, of this is, please? two parts uh, of this agreement with Warren County. The first deals with uh, an agreement concerning uh, their, the county's use at uh, no cost uh, to them of the city's uh, message switch. Uh, the second part of that involves an agreement with the county for us to do under contract dispatching of volunteer uh, fire departments in, in Warren County. About two years ago, we had uh, financial, pro more financial difficulties and we were instructed to work and look at areas in which we could uh, contract out or stop uh, providing services that weren't supported by, by fees. We approached the county about two years ago and we've been working since that time to get to this point tonight and we've worked out an agreement for $27,000 for our police department to continue dispatching. Um, the other one is, again, like we talked about last, last week or two weeks ago, uh, about uh, the message switch. And I'm sure Doug will have more commentary on, on the next municipal order. Are there any questions or discussion? As Mr. <coughs> Pearson and Mr. Harmon from the Sheriff's Office and uh, Emergency Management are here, too, if you have any questions for them, as well as chief, the Chief of Police. Any discussion or questions? Please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. 
And we need to remove Municipal Order 2012-220 from the table. So moved. Second. second. Motion by Denning and second by Hill. There's no discussion on that particular <coughs> motion, so please call the roll. Hill? Yes. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. And now consideration of Municipal Order 2012-220. Municipal order approving and authorizing the mayor to execute an agreement related to the connection of the city's CAD system between the city of Bowling Green and Western Kentucky University. So moved. Second. Motion by Nash and second by Waltrip. And do you want to speak about this one yeah. again too? Uh, this represents the same uh, type of agreement we just executed with Warren County and it applies to uh, WKU. Uh, Doug Hawkins wasn't able to make our last meeting, but he's here tonight. It might be helpful if he could share some thoughts with you about uh, how this came about, what we're trying to affect, and the benefit of this to uh, WKU and possibly the city. Doug? Did, did you have any questions or comments before the chief came out? No, I can't okay. wait till after. Okay. Thank you, Mr. DeFebo, Mayor, Commission. Um, I guess let me speak in general terms about, uh, and if I could bring the, the county agreement back into this discussion because it's, uh, I guess we viewed it um, maybe in, in, a, in a similar way. Um, the city of Bowling Green has had uh, a computer aided dispatch system for about 15 years. Uh, and, and we have, uh, of, the, of the three agencies that we're talking about, the Warren County Sheriff's Office, the uh, Western Kentucky University Police Department, in the city, the city was uh, the only agency that had uh, a CAD system. Um, recently, uh, both of those agencies have seen the need and have the desire to uh, purchase their own CAD systems. In that discussion, uh, or, or as part of the discussion of, of them purchasing CAD systems, um, there was a realized potential benefit if they would uh, utilize the same vendor for their CAD systems that we currently have, which is a company called Enroute out of Tampa, Florida. And uh, part of that discussion was could we maximize, uh, is, was there anything in terms of uh, information uh, or information sharing that we could maximize as a result of three similar systems now being in existence in Warren County and three separate law enforcement agencies. And, and I guess the short answer is, from a technical aspect, there is a way to um, provide some connectivity between the CAD systems uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, one is to, uh, and I use the word tethering, one is uh, to allow the other agencies to tether onto a piece of our CAD system uh, called the message switch. And that is the conduit by which we access both uh, the link, which is the state uh, <coughs> records database for running license plates and, and uh, driver's license and those kinds of things. Um, it also is the conduit to allow us to um, get information through the national, the NCIC, database which allows us to search for wanted people nationwide uh, to search for stolen items nationwide and and the like and so uh, we already have that in place technologically it was possible for the other two agencies to uh, tether to that piece of equipment that we had uh, to also reach the link and NCIC databases without having to purchase their own uh, message switch the other component of the, the discussion was could we, uh, if we chose to, have a technical solution that would allow the, the three independent uh, computer-aided dispatch systems to uh, share information or to give each agency some search rights to the other agency's databases. And that is also possible. And uh, it's it's a it's a I'm I probably don't have any business speaking to the to the technical details, uh, but but it, uh, Gene Harmon and I were having a discussion earlier this uh, week, and the simple analogy is that the way that, that the agencies will be connected, it's like uh, the cable line that comes into your house for cable TV and and internet and that sort of thing. 
you have one cable that comes into the house and then you split it off and you either split it off to two or three TVs and maybe your computer system. Well, it's one cable in and then you split it based on how many times you want to create these connections. One connection would be for the message switch. One connection would be what they call a network connection that would allow the, the servers of these systems to talk to one another and that is where you get the ability to search their database or they search our database. The message switch component of that is simply to, for all the agencies, to uh, have a direct connect uh, to the link and NCIC uh, databases outside of our organizations. So um, we, we recognize that there was some benefit in, in connecting uh, these uh, similar CAD systems by the same vendor. Um, there, there was some connectivity costs that, that we were not willing to share. Uh, we thought it, that if we were going to make our uh, uh, system component available to them, that certainly it would be reasonable to ask them to um, incur the connection costs. Um, and I don't think there's any uh, question that that is uh, an accepted cost. There is, uh, uh, I can say this with virtual certainty, there is no added wear and tear on our equipment by the, any of these connections. There's no added cost to the agency. Uh, we're going to incur a, a certain amount of cost um, to continue to operate our CAD system, our message switch. Um, and, and so uh, we have a, a, a controlled uh, cost on that uh, that doesn't change whether or not an agency connects to us. And so um, our hope was create uh, some interest in all the parties to connect effectively to one another so that there can be access to data that they generate. They can have access to data that we generate. Um, and as I said to, to someone earlier this week, as an agency, we probably generate the most information. And some, some would say you generate the most information, you would then share the most information or potentially share the most information. And that in some way um, has, has uh, a comparative worth in terms of volume of information. But what I'll tell you as a, as a, as a, um, a real point of interest for us is you never know which piece of information is the most valuable. So, you know, when you're, when you're doing investigations and you're searching for that proverbial needle in the haystack, um, that piece of information that, that the county may have in their CAD system may ultimately benefit us. Certainly any information in our system may benefit them. Uh, uh, same thing with Western Kentucky University Police uh, between us and them. Uh, there's also a safety component. If, um, if we stop a, a car on traffic, for instance, uh, and we have the ability to search Western's database or search the county's database, um, and they've had contact with this person before and, and perhaps we have not, um, they're going to have some information that's available to us that may be useful. And conversely, the same thing would be true for them if we'd had contact with a person that they were currently in contact with. So I guess from our perspective, and I think from <coughs> the other law enforcement agencies' perspectives, was we saw this sort of university, universally collective benefit of information sharing um, uh, by, by connecting the, uh, the, the CAD systems um, knowing that um, we were essentially offering what we had for the cost of connection. Um, but it was more about information uh, that would be available to them from us or available to us from them via this connection uh, while at the same time not adding to our cost to operate our CAD system. And so um, with, uh, with staff help, we, we talked to the county, we talked to Western, um, we created some tentative agreements um, based on some, some common values, um, created the agreements that we've brought before the commission um, obviously, we uh, already dealt with the, the, the county agreement, um, and, and we've asked for the same consideration, obviously, for Western Kentucky University Police, um, given that we feel like there's value for us and for them um, by creating this relationship and this connection. 
And uh, that's, that's probably in the most simple terms that I can put it. Mr. Dean. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I don't mind saying I, I, excuse my voice, I got a cold. I'm getting a little confused about this and I'm going to ask maybe one or two questions. Uh, we're paying for the system. We're paying for our system only. <clears throat> Warren County is going to be on the system. I guess, l let me clarify. Um, the county will own their own independent CAD system that we don't <coughs> have any financial investment in. Okay, I understand that. Okay, okay. they're going to own theirs. Yes. What is Western going to own or what is Western going to participate in? And if they participate, are they going to have any costs? They're, Connection they're to, costs, whatever. The, it, it, as far as I know, their intent is to buy their own standalone CAD system that, that the state, I'm sorry, that the city has no financial investment in that can stand alone uh, and function independently without connection to us. The, the, um, the advantage will be if they purchase their own system from the same service provider in route that we have, there is some compatibility in order to connect the two. But they're gonna buy their own system, just like the county's gonna buy their own system. We already, uh, the city already owns our own system. So it's three distinctly separate, independent, computer-aided dispatch systems that we have the ability to connect and allow them on some level for us to share information with them and, and for them to share information with us. Well, where is the money? And who has the money? Well, the county has money for their system. Western has money for their system. We're not investing in either one of their systems. I want to once again thank you, Chief Hawkins, thank the staff for expressing goodwill to both the county government and to Western. And I would like to say no matter how this vote goes tonight, I would like to request from the staff for our commission retreat to put together a list of all organizations slash businesses that we provide in-kind services to and included in that list, if they're on that list and we provide in-kind services, I would like to see if we pay that business for services that they provide us. So in other words, are we giving them something free and they're turning around charging the city of Bowling Green? for a service. And, and that's kind of where I am. I, you know, maybe I don't need to be as confused as I am, but it initially looked like to me, and I agree with Commissioner Hill, that there was going to be a free ride somewhere, and the somewhere was going to be Western. And if, if that's not the case, uh, then the presentation at our last meeting uh, wasn't right, if I'm understanding the things right. The county, the I got them. I got the impression that somewhere along the line there was a free ride by Western. Did y'all get that, or no. was I mm -hmm. the only one? No. Okay, you I didn't, didn't get that. No. We were told, Chief Hawkins, since you weren't here, that it was a switch, that they were not each owning their own CAD system. It was a switch. We were providing all of the cost. The city was incurring all that cost for the system, and they were asking to be a part of this system because of a switch, and that was in turn saving each of those organizations approximately $60,000 per year for switching on to our system. That's how it was explained. I, I, I didn't understand. I mean, I, I, I understood exactly it's, as it's been explained tonight, and that is that we were providing, we were already going to be paying for the service. They were pr paying for their own equipment to hook into our service. That's, that's, that's what was explained as I understood it 
at the last meeting. And, and, and I guess it would be appropriate for me to apologize for not being here last time. Perhaps uh, we, I could have cleared this up uh, at the last meeting and, and we wouldn't have had to uh, delay this. However, um, the, the, and I hope my explanation was <coughs> accurate in that, um, Western will have a significant financial investment in their own CAD system. The only thing they we're asking and, and would, would want to allow them to do is access the state and nation, national databases through our message switch that we already own and then allow each agency to connect to one another to share information. And that's really what we're asking for. We're asking for this quid pro quo of information. Um, while at the same time giving them the courtesy of using our message switch, which we're, we already own, um, we already incur the service expenses on anyway, um, to allow some goodwill for the, those other agencies. Um, that does, in fact, save them in, in round numbers about $60,000 because if they were to invest in that message switch <coughs> component only uh, to add to their CAD system, that is about a $60,000 value. So uh, if we allow them to connect to our message switch, they don't incur that $60,000 added expense on top of their CAD system that they're already going to purchase. And so um, is there some savings to them potentially uh, by not having to buy the, the, the switch, um, but there is some benefit also to us being able to connect uh, and talk to one another through these uh, connections to share information as well. So there's, there's mutual benefit. We're, we're um, arguably going to get some benefit out of these agreements as well, just through the information that we'll share. Is that what you understood? So just so I understand this clearly, as clearly as it can be understood. If we did not, we just approved the county, so we're allowing them to have this switch. That is correct. We're getting ready to vote on that for Western. If we do not allow that switch to take place, what would it cost Western or what would it have cost the county if we hadn't passed it to have access to that information? Uh, through the link in CIC, that's, that message switch that we're talking about, each of those agencies would have had to invest about $60,000 in that piece of equipment. So the city, by allowing them to hook on to this switch, is saying we're allowing you to save your organization $60,000. They will, they will realize the savings, yes. Okay. That's exactly how it was explained at the last meeting. Yeah. And, and, and the documents that I'm looking at in front of me, I mean, I, I think in the interest of, 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 of being honest, I mean, whereas WKU has requested it be allowed to purchase necessary hardware and software to operate an independent CAD system and access and share a message switch within the city's CAD system to allow WKU and the city to transfer data between the parties and allow WKU to obtain NCIC inquiries through the city's CAD system in order to approve efficiency of calls for assistance and on WKU campus. I mean, that, that, that's what was explained last time. That's what's explained this time. Same $60,000 figure was thrown around last time. I mean, but it's not costing the city a dime, a nickel, a penny extra to share information with other police sources. There's no added cost to us. There would be connection costs for them, yes. Uh, Doug, for the purposes of this, of this um, uh, municipal order, <coughs> did we approach WKU to be involved in this or did they approach us? Uh, Western, uh, to my memory, which I think is pretty good, Western heard about our conversations with the county and uh, Chief Dean called me and asked if we would be interested in a similar agreement with them. Okay. In terms of what Melinda is, is talking about, um, I do agree with her, uh, with her idea about at the retreat in January to come up with a, a good figure on exactly how many of these um, uh, situations that we're doing over the whole city, not just police. Um, but I also, um, I also think that I would like to probably um, support this municipal order and look at 
the issue in broader terms. And I'm sure that WKU, uh, with uh, getting a new, uh, or beginning to start on a, I'm sure the uh, uh, building of a new police department and the parking structure up there needs to get underway with all of these things. So I think that uh, I would be in support of passing this one, although I don't disagree with Melinda's uh, assertion that we should look into uh, what we do for other organizations and other agencies in a more comprehensive way. And I think that would be best done in January. I would just like to, is there anyone here from Western representing them? Not that I'm aware of. But we had people here from Warren County representing We did. Okay, thank you. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that you said it, and perhaps it didn't register at the time. Uh, I thought we were talking about the switch, but you're, you're talking about actually sharing information from our databases, whether it's an accident report, incident report, contact cards, and, and that sort of method too? The, the, yes. Um, two, two different functions would be served. One, uh, through this conduit of shared information, uh, there is a connection to the switch that allows them to go out for in link and NCIC information. That part of it I got. Now the second there is part. also a second connection between the two systems. Uh, and I used the analogy earlier. It's like cable coming into your house and then you split it off to two or three different TVs. Same thing. One connection goes to each location and then we hook one connection to the, the switch. We hook another connection to the server part of the system. That's where you share information back and forth. That's where, given some administrative rights, would, which we would have to agree on the details of those administrative rights, but um, through the software, we allow them certain access to our database. They can search it just like we can, <coughs> given, given some limitations. Uh, and the same courtesy we would want returned, that we could search their database. Um, primarily, and what, what I think would be most useful is um, our prior calls for service, which you know, if, if we go to an address, you know, there's a there's a, uh, a a call for service created every time we we go to a police call. Um, the information that's in those CAD notes is invaluable many times. Um, also, our our person's file, which if if we write a citation to someone, that information is forever in our computer system and the date and the time and the details of that contact. Um, so there's a lot of investigative information that's potentially available um, through that sh information sharing. And that's what I was talking about before, before is um, they're going to be gathering information that we don't have. We're going to be gathering information that they don't have, but because we allow them to look at ours and they allow us to look at theirs through this connection, um, it's effectively like we, have, we all share much of the same database. How do they get that information now? They call and ask and we research it for them? Uh, if they need it, that's exactly what happens. We have to, we have to uh, respond to their request. So if they can look directly, then that saves our officers time having to do that for them? Yes, yes. Okay. So, it, so it might actually save us some money too. And that can be done in the field. We can do it in the field through our, our MDCs, um, ideally. And, and again, all that's the technological, sol technological solution, but our, our uh, in-car computers access our database now, so they should be able to access Western's database exactly the same way. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Do you have any, this is probably unfair, but I've asked you unfair questions before. Uh, uh, do you know if Western, uh, absent of this, agreement the way it's written now, do you, will, will they invest in that technology to do that with us? Has there been any discussions if this doesn't pass? I haven't had the, I haven't had the discussion of what if yeah. uh, with them. Uh, I, I, there is, there is, is real benefit to having this message switch and without trying to get too technical, um, every agency that has an uh, they have a link NCIC machine, which is basically a standalone computer that if that if your the police officer has to run a license or license plate, <coughs> they have to uh, hard enter that information into that computer that then runs at the state level or the national level. 
Well, what this switch does and what the real value of this switch does is if you put that information into the CAD system, you only have to enter it one time and then it automates that search through the link system or the NCIC system. And there is an efficiency and a safety value into that for that message switch. That's why we invested in it years ago and that's why there's value in it for them. I think the final comment I have, I go back to, I commend Melinda for bringing this issue up because it's more than just WKU and, and I think uh, all of us would see the value of connectivity. Uh, I think we're talking about the manner of which we're reimbursed or not reimbursed. But I commend her for bringing up the issue to try to get this um, uh, in a more comprehensive uh, um, uh, uh, method for us to look at in the future going ahead, going ahead with the future with these uh, type of issues and have a policy decision made by this board <laughs> so that staff can know how to handle these negotiations in the future. So I commend her for that. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. What does the commission want for the retreat exactly? I believe, well, I believe we're talking I, about I, what we're, what we're doing think, yeah. exchanges. You're looking for how much, what other services we're subsidizing? Correct. Okay. And if we receive something in return for them, whether it's monetary or quid pro quo or okay. some other kind of in kind would of that service. Include, uh, free property? We I'm sorry? Pro would that include like property where we own a property but we let Smiles use it for free? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it needs to be included. I, I think it's an excellent. Suggestion. Like the police right. contracts and uh, funeral escorts and 50% rate on yep. for all these different things. Yeah, I think things. it's good for us to know what all that we're doing for other people and determine whether or not from, like Bill said, from a policy okay. standpoint, how we want to approach those. I, I think it's a, a great suggestion. And I appreciate the information tonight to help clarify in my mind. I'm probably going to support this because I didn't, when it was first presented, I didn't get the fact that, that in that sharing of information, if whether it's the sheriff's office or, or Western, anybody else, they're calling for information. Somebody has to stop and look that up and then provide it to them where they can bypass that step that takes up our manpower. Correct. Uh, and, to, and that's the way that I was trying to say a little earlier that I interpreted. I did not, and I told Melinda, uh, I, I didn't interpret the presentation earlier the way that I see it to not. And I had the same concerns that uh, Melinda has pertaining to this. And, uh, you know, I think all of us up here are concerned about the fact that everybody can be a part of our programming especially when we are paying the money. You know, we always up front and everybody's always knocking on our door. And uh, we can't be supportive of everybody's program out there in the world. We've got to look out, as you know, well know, uh, for what we're trying to do for the citizens of the city of Bowling Green. So uh, I have to be honest, I feel a little better in understanding uh, this procedure or process uh, if I'm a police officer out there and I'm stopped, I've got a car stopped, I'm on all the information I can get. I don't care where it's coming from. You let me know what's going on. Uh, and I see it that way tonight. Uh, but uh, Melinda's suggesting let's get something to discuss after the first of the year, uh, what we've got out there, what's going on, and we can always, <coughs> excuse me, make better informed decisions. All right, any other discussion? Comments? Please call the roll. Hill? No. Nash? Yes. Waltrip? Yes. Denning? No. Wilkerson? Yes. That concludes our regular uh, agenda. We've got something very important to take care of at this point. We want to take a few moments and acknowledge uh, our colleague Slim Nash and his family is here with him, his son Will and daughter Presley, set through this hour and 20 minutes of 
of meeting on the last night. I told him it'd be 30 minute meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were wrong we again, Slim. <laughs> we wanted to acknowledge the, the eight years of dedicated service that you've given to the city of Bowling Green. Uh, and I think uh, while I get some presence out here behind, I think Mr. Denning would like to start us, if you would. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> again, excuse my voice. Uh, this part of the agenda is one that I, I don't like. And I say that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I don't like this part. You know, there's an old saying that all of us are well aware of Slim, and it goes something like this. Uh, oh, what a tangle web we weave when first we practice to deceive. You have not deceived the citizens of Bowling Green in the years that you've been here. The thing I like about you is the fact uh, you're slim. And that's all that anyone that elects us to office can ask of the person, is that they be themselves and do what is best for the citizens of Bowling Green. Now, <clears throat> In those years that you have been a city commissioner, uh, you went through a process. And that process was that uh, you filled out an application. You sent in your resume to your possible employer. And the employer was going to be the citizens of the city of Bowling Green. And you were hired on more than one occasion by that employer. And a job well done. Um, you know, <coughs> excuse me. A lot of people have gone through that same process where they've submitted resumes. They weren't employed. So you have no reason whatsoever, ever, to be ashamed of the fact that you're leaving here. You're leaving me with the fact, and I hope you understand it, and I think you do, that you have done a tremendous job. There are more individuals out there that have submitted resumes then there have been individuals that has gotten the job that the five of us are up here with tonight. Uh, you have represented the citizens of Bowling Green to the best of your ability. Uh, and we have talked personally about things, and we talked many years ago about the skate park. And I told you, if you remember right, uh, I told you that Slim, had I been here with you, I probably wouldn't have voted for the skate park. Well, that just goes to show you uh, the lack of knowledge that I have about things. That has been one of the best facilities that the city of Bowling Green has had since day one. I commend you for it. And I know uh, there are going to, there's going to be some big bubbers out there in the community tonight that's going to see this or is going to hear uh, look at what Katie writes, and they're going to say, well, that was the proper thing for old Joe to say under the circumstances and so on and so on. It's only proper if the person that is speaking means what they say. I mean what I say. You have never told me anything that I couldn't have taken to the bank. Uh, 
I always, Slim, tell me about this. You are always straightforward with me. And that's all anyone can ask. You cannot attach money to that. That's important in life, regardless of whether you're a city commissioner or whatever your vocation may be. It is commendable. I want, <coughs> I want you to leave tonight with your head high, nothing to be ashamed of. I've been there before. Matter of fact, it was your group that beat me. <laughs> yes, sir. You didn't think I was going to bring it up, did you? I, I kind of hoped you wouldn't have. Yeah. <laughs> but, serious, it has never affected on my part, and I don't, don't think on your part, our relationship. We have never had a conversation about that until tonight. And that is the only time in almost 40 years that I've been in elective office that I've been beaten. And we've never had that discussion. Because, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you applied for a job and the employer hired you. And fired me. <laughs> but I want, I wish you well. I want you to do things with your family, those two out there especially. Both are my buddies. And uh, I wish you well, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any other comments for representative? I don't have a microphone. What I have to present here to you are uh, items from the city. These are items from the city that we have to present. And one, I think you'll know about, and two, probably that you haven't seen before. So, <coughs> to you, and that's going to make you have a knife to have on for my solace. It's not a hundred dollar bill, is it? I was expecting another mayor to pull out a knife for me. <laughs> you know. There's got to be something wrong with you to want this job, you know. <laughs> Is this Jay's? Oh, that's Jay, fantastic. Jay Dark, he drew that for you. Is that right? Yes. We can see it. our landscape. Uh, it's, a, it's a hand hand drawn. Uh, <coughs> it appears cool, painted or, or, yeah, uh, maybe penciled. Uh, Rendition of the skate park. It's fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you, Jay. I agree. Evident, evidently. evidently. Mayor, Mayor, while he's opening. Sure. Mayor, while you're opening that, Slim, I just want to leave um, with three funny things. And I'm really upset you didn't wear this tonight, but. As the citizens know, I was first appointed to this position. So on a very nerve-wracking night of my life when I was interviewing with newspapers on the windows of City Hall, Slim, of course, was in that meeting in the hottest pink shirt you've ever seen with paisley print all over it. And it did nothing but make me smile during that. Another funny experience with Slim, and I was so glad the Daily News reported that he came to Western on a swimming scholarship. I had no idea about that till I was appointed to the commission. And we're all at dinner one night at Mariah's between work session and commission meeting. And I looked at him, I said, I had no idea you swam for Western. Well, Slim stands up in the restaurant, and it was full, and he does the pose of a bodybuilder and says, what? You can't believe this body didn't swim? So, thank you. And one last thing. Of course, you all can't really see unless we stand up what we're wearing <laughs> under here. One night this summer, Slim happened to wear shorts under here. And you all wouldn't have known this. But when he turns around to talk, I notice his shorts, and I just get tickled because it showed his tan line on his leg. So thank you for, uh, even though we've disagreed on some issues, a lot of fun memories, and thank you very much. Thank you. 
I, I will say the upside of a tan line is that means I don't wear a Speedo anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is from Laura and Kelly, is that correct? Uh, yeah, Kim. the public information officer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this this is great. This is uh, uh, various pictures of the skate park during construction and, and during its opening, uh, breaking ground on it. Uh, it's it's uh, something that, that, that I'll cherish. Thank you. Thank you to them. And the last one. Oh, yeah, we overdone this time. That's right. <laughs> That'd be a budget report about this yeah <laughs> the retreat really hey that's fantastic fountain square, fountain square park, park. No, no, no better park in the country. Uh, and interestingly enough, I learned that there are two other fountains exactly like ours. Uh, and I didn't know that. Exact replicas in, in two other parks in the country. So uh, thank you very much. Slim, I'm probably, probably one of the few as I look around in here. I may, I'm probably the only one that has seen that park, that Fountain Square Park, with 24 inches of snow around it in 1960. I hope you remain the only one to have ever seen that joke. <laughs> <laughs> and so does Bobby Phelps uh, in the Public Works Department. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to tell you, it, it has been uh, a, a great eight years. Uh, there have been some highs, there have been some lows, uh, but overall uh, it's, it's been a fantastic eight years. Uh, when uh, the very first meeting that I attended, uh, th this room was actually under some kind of construction and we met across the street in uh, the fiscal courtroom. And at that meeting uh, were my son Will and my daughter Presley. And uh, they graciously, w without complaint, agreed to attend uh, my last meeting too. And so I want to recognize them. The Sa sacrifices uh, that that I may have made for this job uh, pale and compared to the sacrifices that they've made for me to be able to do this job. Uh, I've missed numerous concerts, uh, numerous swim meets, numerous basketball practices, cheerleading practices, PTA nights. Uh, it seemed like it never failed that when they had something going on related to school, it fell on a Tuesday night somewhere in between 4 and, and 9. Uh, and and they, they gave up an awful lot of me so that I could be here. And so uh, n no final meeting would be complete, in my opinion, without a recognition of them. And so I thank you both, and I love you both. Uh, this this job uh, of of all the jobs I've had uh, has been the best job that I've ever had, uh, uh, and and for for reasons that people probably don't understand. I think a lot of people think uh, uh, I have too too healthy of an ego, uh, and uh, I've never made any bones about that. Uh, but it's not because I get to be on TV, and it's not because uh, people know my name. Uh, I love this job because of the number of people that I've been able to meet and the number of people that I've been able to listen to. Uh, I couldn't help every one of them. Uh, government cannot solve every problem that people bring forward. Uh, but it was an honor to me to be able to meet them, whether that's standing in knee-high water uh, because there's a drainage ditch, the ditch in Shawnee Estates that isn't draining right at 11 o'clock at night, uh, or whether it's uh, talking to a lady about getting a stripe down a road uh, so <coughs> that she thinks the traffic will move more slowly. Uh, you know, the big ones are, are the smoking ordinance, and I can hear uh, the, the raspy-throated groans as I say that right now, uh, the, the skate park. Uh, the, the TIF district, which I believe is the largest economic development project that's ever come to the city of Bowling Green. It's not about baseball to me. It's not about Skypack. It's not about parks. 
it's about continuing for Bowling Green to grow from an economic standpoint. Uh, and, and those are the big things. The little things mean as much to me too, and that is meet, meeting various people. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to go on very long, uh, and so I'll close with two things. Uh, Joe, I think you'll appreciate this. I'm going to quote a wrestler. Uh, there, there's, and, and, and my mom would be disappointed of all the people I might be able to quote uh, that I would pick a wrestler. But there's a wrestler. His name's John Foley. He goes by the name Mankind. And uh, I'm not a wrestling fan. I don't watch wrestling. I know, him. I know you do. You've probably met him. Uh, he, he said years ago, long before I was elected to office, I, I saw a report on him on, on some kind of news program, and what, what he said then is a, exactly uh, how I hope people will uh, remember my, my time on the commission, and that is he said that he wanted to be remembered as a guy with a thimble full of talent and a truckload full of intestinal fortitude. And, and that's, to me, what this job was about for me. Uh, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, and I don't have all the answers. Um, but what I have and what I was never afraid to use was my backbone. Uh, and sometimes you just got to stand up and you just stand alone uh, when you do it. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I hope if, if people remember me at all, they would remember me that way. And I'll close with, uh, with if I ever write a book, I'm going to uh, have a title of a, that, that I got in Sam's Club, of all places. I tell a lot of stories about Sam's Club, which is interesting to me. Maybe I hang out there. They do have wonderful, what Presley calls appetizers, which are actually samples, and maybe that's why I'm hanging out in Sam's Club all the time. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, I ran into, it was right after my first term, I'd been elected to my second term uh, by a uh, enormous margin of 14 votes and when I said 14 I meant 14 votes uh, and a gentleman uh, came up to me uh, I don't remember his name uh, he was uh, by by his him telling me the story in his late 80s and uh, he said so you won again and it didn't come across as a compliment <laughs> and I said yeah uh, I hung on there like a hair in a biscuit and uh, uh, I barely made it. And he said, there aren't many things you do that I agree with. And I thought, again, not a compliment. Uh, and then he said, but I'll tell you what. Uh, you stab people in the front. And I said, all right, I stab people in the front. What does that mean? And he said, it's a whole lot better than being stabbed in the back. And... That sums it up for me. Uh, I don't want to stab anybody in the back. I'm okay with being in a room full of people that don't agree with me and articulating my position and defending my position, and hopefully we can all leave friendly. Uh, we can disagree uh, about the issues but not have to be disagreeable with one another. So uh, I hope those two things are, are two ways, if remembered at all, that I would be remembered that I don't stab people in the back. and and that uh, I had a backbone and I wasn't afraid to use it. I, I thank all of you for, for this time. I thank the city for the gifts, uh, especially Jay and, and, and Kim and Laura and those in public information. I appreciate the kind comments that you all said. Uh, I, and and I, I very much appreciate the confidence that the voters have had in me for, for four terms. It's, uh, and I, I wish the four of you the very best of luck. and. And I wish uh, Commissioner-elect Rick Williams the best of luck. Th this is a tough gig sometimes. Uh, this isn't hard like digging ditches. That's hard. Uh, but this has its own hard qualities to it. And uh, it has been my absolute pleasure to be able to serve up here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a 10-minute recess while we get it.